the Old Testament again and to the prophecy of Isaiah. Prophecy of Isaiah and chapter 63. Isaiah and chapter 63, please. We're going to read from verse 1 down to the end of verse 8. Eight verses from Isaiah chapter 63. Isaiah 63, beginning at verse 1. Who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Bosra? This one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I who speak in righteousness mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone and from the people no one was with me. I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. The blood is sprinkled upon my garments. I have stained all my robes. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my Redeemer has come. I looked, but there was no one to help, and I wondered, and there was no one to uphold. Therefore my own arm brought salvation for me. My own fury, it sustained me. I have trodden down the peoples in my anger, made them drunk in my fury, and brought down the strength to the earth. I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord and the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has bestowed on us, and the great goodness towards the house of Israel which he has bestowed on them according to his mercies, according to the multitude of his loving kindness. For he said, Surely they are my people, children who will not lie. So he became their saviour. Amen. And so reads God's wonderful and inerrant word. Now we're not going to look deeply into this chapter, uh, into this passage, because as we see here, uh, we see Christ here, uh, we see the Messiah, uh, the messenger of the covenant here, we see his sufferings here, but I want to take as a text, just as a text in verse 7. If you'd like to look at that, verse 7, I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord has bestowed on us. And so I just want to reflect on those thoughts that has blessed me, and I trust it will bless you, to mention God's loving kindness, to sing his praises, to think of what he has given us and has bestowed on us. We come to worship, we come to give thanks, we come to say hallelujah anyway because God is on the throne and he will remember his own. So when we look back, look back over the years, some of us look back over the decades of life and we look forward to the future, we should be able to say, I think, these words in our text if we are saved by grace. I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord has bestowed upon us. When the prophet Samuel led the people of Israel into battle at Mizpah, they won a great battle and he wanted them to remember the loving kindness of God. And so he got a great stone And he erected it so that every time the people of God would see that stone, they would say, Ebenezer, Ebenezer. And they would remember the loving kindness and the mercy and the blessing of God. And Ebenezer means, thus far the Lord 
has helped us. Eben, eben is uh, the word for stone and uh, ezer is the word for help, the stone of help, literally. But we translate it thus far, the Lord has helped us. And isn't it wonderful to say, thank you, Lord, for helping me. And so why did he raise up the stone? Well, because we're apt to forget, aren't we? We're apt to be ungrateful, aren't we? And Samuel said, I want the people to be grateful to God, their Savior, their Father in heaven. I want their hearts to be full of gratitude. I want them to trust God. I want them to be patient in the future. Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. Ebenezer. And so there is hope, dear friends, in our faith. Hope in Jesus, who is sent from heaven. He is God's Son. He is God's Redeemer. He has sent the Spirit. And he has guided us by his word. And he has given us the church and the people of God and the ministers of God who support us in the pilgrimage of life. And this is why I read from Psalm 23 earlier on. Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Interestingly enough, in the Hebrew, it doesn't say, yea, though I walk. It says, when I walk. When I walk. Because he knows, as he writes it, the pilgrimage hasn't ended. But there are going to be times when we go through a valley. A valley that's dark. A valley that needs a shepherd. A valley that needs uh, strength to go on if we're going to get through. And so he says, you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I think the rod there is about the Lord's shepherd guiding the sheep, keeping them out of the potholes or, or helping them up. I mean, it speaks of his staff. Well, a shepherd always has a staff, and it speaks of his presence. So he says that when I walk through the valley, I'm going to know the Lord's help, keeping me out of the potholes, keeping me away from the rocks. And I'm going to know the Lord's presence, because he's there. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Surely goodness, he says, and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He's given us grace that saves us, and he gives us grace that keeps us, and he gives us grace that will take us to the house of God, because he will show us mercy all the days of our life. And when Isaiah penned these words, he was speaking of the future because the people of Israel were so backslidden that God just took them into all the nations. And as a nation, they disintegrated. And as a temple, it was lost. And he still loved them. And Isaiah was a great example of, of a servant of God. When he writes this, he speaks to the elect people, the nation of Israel. But he also speaks to the nations round about, telling them that they will know God's judgment because of sin and unbelief. And that's, that's the call of, of the, the church ministers today, the evangelical ministers. Sadly, we don't hear that in liberal churches or dead churches but the churches that have the word of God and believe it and preach it, they're like Isaiah. They speak prophetically, a word of warning to the nation. They speak with hope, words of promise to the people of God. And this is the task that a pastor has to do and the people of God have to support. Right at the very beginning of Isaiah 
chapter 1, we have this word in 1, uh, 27. Zion shall be redeemed, redeemed with justice and their penitence with righteousness. Zion, the people of God, they shall be redeemed. How shall they be redeemed with justice? Jesus died on the cross. We have it here. We have it here. He's trodden the winepress alone. And his garments were sprinkled with blood. Justice was God laying on him the iniquity of us all. He became sin for us. One preacher said, when God looked on Jesus on the cross, all he could see was sin. That's all he saw. And judgment fell on him. And he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But that was the moment of redemption. And Isaiah speaks of it. He speaks all through this book about what God is going to do. And so the church is to preach salvation, is to preach redemption, is to preach comfort, is to preach hope, even when society around about us is disintegrating and becoming more and more evil and the priests and the politicians because that's who he speaks against and the magistrates were all anti-God they said we know better we like it the way we want it and so dear friends we're living in such days we're living in such days but let's say and remember, I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord has bestowed on us because he has not deserted us. And we can say, thank you, Lord, for the past and thank you, Lord, for the future. As Christians, then, we recognize that our religion is not man-made. It's God-made, God-ordained. God's Son, Jesus Christ, is sent from heaven to redeem us, the Spirit to guide us, the Word to support us and teach us. And so the God of hope is still our God. And he will remember his own. So let's go back again then to this verse. I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord has bestowed upon us. And so with the time left, I want to mention three things that this brings to me. Three obvious things that I trust we will reflect upon and be grateful for. The first is this. We are debtors to God's mercy. Those who are saved are debtors to God's mercy. The judgment is coming, but those who are saved are debtors to God's mercy. Look at the words again I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord. And that word in Hebrew is mentioned back in chapter 55, and there it's translated the sure mercies of God. Isaiah 55, 3, I come to me, he says to the people, here and your soul shall live. Here and your soul shall live. So many hear, but they don't hear. They hear, but they don't understand. They hear, but they don't come to him. Come to me. Hear and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The sure mercies, the loving kindness of David. God works through covenants. God's covenants are still with us. The everlasting covenant we have here. I will make an everlasting covenant. Isaiah 55, 3. With you. The sure mercies of David is his loving kindness. God loves us and he makes a covenant to protect us, keep us and redeem us. And we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Now, this word everlasting covenant means a perpetual covenant. It's mentioned 16 times in the Old Testament and it's mentioned once in the New Testament, it always refers then to that covenant promise that God has made with his elect people. The first we can remember, we know it, 
It's the covenant that he made with Noah. Remember, he said to Noah, we'll put a, a rainbow in the sky, children. You've seen the rainbow, haven't you? We see it all around, don't we? It's nothing to do with people who are bad. It's to do with God who's good. God who's good. And it says, I will never bring a worldwide flood upon the earth again. It was a covenant. So we see the rainbow and we see the covenant of God saying there shall be no flooding of the whole earth again. And the second covenant comes through Abraham. And God said to Abraham, his descendants will fill the land and he will give the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession to them. And his seal was this, that he would circumcise their hearts. So this last reference is the most important one. Listen to this from Hebrews 13. Now may the God of peace who brought you up from the brought up the Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete. That's what he's doing in my life and your life. Sometimes it, you wonder, but he's making your salvation complete. Make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So, brethren and sisters, we have much to praise God for. We must praise him for his word. We must praise him for his everlasting covenant. We must praise him for all the blessings. Now, when Charles Spurgeon thought in this, he, he asked his congregation, have you had mercies that have been experienced? Has God opened providential doors that you've asked for? Has he given precious milestones along the roads of your life? Thank him for them. And were you sick, but he brought you health? Did he show you sure mercies? And when you felt poor, did he supply your needs and answer prayer? And when danger threatened you and you wondered whether you could cope, did he deliver you? My friends, let's mention the loving kindness of the Lord. How good is the God we adore. And can we forget then that day of our salvation? I was 19. I remember the story now. It's my story, but it's his grace. Listen to what Spurgeon says. Consider what you owe God's power. How he raised you from your death and sin. How he has preserved your spiritual life. How he has kept you from falling. And how through a thousand enemies, though... Your path has been beset. You have been able to hold on all your way. My friend, there's been lots of blessings, hasn't there? There's been lots of trouble, hasn't there? But God is worthy of our praise. Remember his loving kindness, his sure mercies. Trust him for the days that lie ahead. I will mention the loving kindness of God and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord has bestowed on us. So we're debtors to God's mercy. We're debtors secondly to God's love. I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord. Do you remember his loving kindnesses to you? If you don't, maybe you're not saved. Maybe you're religious. Maybe you say your prayers at night. Before I was a Christian, I said my prayers for three years at night. The Lord's Prayer, I said it every night. But I wasn't a Christian. Are you a Christian? Can you remember his loving kindnesses, his sure mercies? I think it's an incredible wonder that God should forgive us and love us. We're all sinners. 
We're all fallen in Adam. It's impossible for us to keep the Ten Commandments. We have broken his commandments, and yet he still loves us. Hallelujah, what a Savior. He still loves us. And if we believe, and if we fear God, and if we're sorry for our sins, past and ongoing, and repent, he will heal, he will bless, he will adopt us into his family. I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord and the praises of God. It's incredible, an incredible wonder that God should forgive us. And it's an incredibly wonderful that we should experience forgiveness and its peace and its assurance. Look out there. They're all the way to football, maybe, or, or to the supermarket or to something else. And there's no sense of forgiveness. There's no sense of assurance. There's no joy in God or in his son. But isn't there in our hearts? Amen. In 1 John, at the end of the New Testament, there's a big stress on assurance. 1 John 3.19 says, And by this we know, notice we know, not we think, or we might have, or we could have. No, by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. Assurance is a mark. Personal assurance is a mark that we're saved. We may try to please God and do our best and stop swearing and keep his commandments and not getting drunk as much or, or whatever. But we keep doing it because we're not empowered by the Spirit. Personal assurance is a blessing. It's of the essence of faith. It's a fruit of faith. Now, the Roman Catholic Church denies this. The Roman Catholic Church says all uh, their, their members and baptized members uh, can never be assured. They've got to keep coming to the Mass and they've got to keep coming to, uh, to do penance and be forgiven by the priest. And they've got to keep uh, all the rules. And then they might manage to get out of purgatory in about a million years. That's what they teach them. Now, they don't say it publicly because if they say it publicly then they expose them as liars because remember, everybody that dies as a Roman Catholic has gone to heaven, they say, publicly. But that's not what they teach. You see, personal assurance has got to do with the Spirit of God. And you've got to be saved. You've got to be born again. Now, this was a big problem to the English Puritans in the 17th and 18th century. I'm not sure I mentioned this before. But it's in my sermon here. And when in the 17th and 18th century, England and Britain was Christian, right? And dominated by Anglicanism. Okay, the, the Church of England in England, Presbyterianism in Scotland mainly. And, um, and there would be Roman Catholicism in the south of Ireland. And so when babies were baptized, they were accepted as Christians. They came into the church, right? And then when they got a bit older, they were confirmed. And the Roman Catholic children dress up to get confirmed. Uh, the rest of us just stand there and the bishop prays over us and then we can take communion. But why was it that they didn't have assurance, all these people? They didn't have assurance because they weren't saved. That's why. They had religion, but they weren't saved. They had been baptized and they had been blessed and they had gone to uh, confess their sins to the priest, but they would not got assurance. Because assurance, it comes from faith. And when you're born again, you're given faith. And when you're born again, the Spirit of God is in your heart. Listen to Ephesians 1, 3, 1, 13. Whom also having believed, you are sealed with the spirit of promise. Now a seal is something that makes something secure. Put a stamp on it, a seal in it, it's secure. And 
it's safe. And when the Spirit seals a believer, they're safe, right? They're safe in the arms of Jesus. And the great theologians wrestled with this in the 17th and 18th century. And the, most of the Anglicans, and they were believers, but they couldn't understand why all these people who had been baptized as infants and had been blessed by the bishop all lived godless lives. And even when they tried not to live godless lives, they didn't have any assurance. And they, they wrestled with that theologically until a man called John Owen came along, a Congregationalist. And John Owen showed that it was because they weren't born again. Salvation, conversion, and at salvation and conversion, we're sealed by the Spirit. He produces assurance. He brings peace to the soul. It's not a post conversion experience. It's not after you get saved, it's when you get saved. The people then who experience it after they're saved were never saved before. They were saved now. And that's why you get some people who have been brought up Christians, think they're Christians, but then when they're born again, there's joy, there's peace, there's hope. Because they had religion, but they didn't have the new birth. So John tells us in John 1, that if we believe, we are called the children of God, and we have an understanding about him who is true. So don't depend on baptism. Don't depend on the bishop. Depend on the gospel. You must be born again. I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord. I will praise the Lord according to all that the Lord has bestowed on us. We're debtors to God's mercy. We're debtors to God's love. And finally, we're debtors to God's grace. We owe God's our praise and thanksgiving for his free grace. Grace is free. We cannot work for it, but we can ask for it. It's a gift of God. Having broken his commandments, we need to seek his mercy. And we've talked about mercy. When we break his commandments, we must remember his love. We've talked about love. And it fills our heart when the Spirit comes in. And then we must look to his grace. There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son. Are we saved? See, grace is when God pardons us when we don't deserve it. It's undeserved favor, said the theologians. It results in saving grace. It results in assurance. It results in joy and peace in the soul. So by grace, says Paul, you are saved through faith. It is a gift of God. It's not by going to the priest. It's not by trying your best. It's through faith. It's so simple as that and yet so difficult as that. Because people sometimes try faith. They try faith. And there are books out that say, well, just believe and it'll happen. You can't try faith. Faith is a gift of the Spirit. You've got to seek God. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be open. So grace brings regeneration. The Spirit's work in our heart. It leads to justification by faith only. It leads to sanctification, an ongoing pilgrimage. And that bestows righteous desires in us. It imparts strength to endure the trials and to resist temptations. God's building his church. So justification is immediate, but sanctification is ongoing. As we walk by faith, as we trust the Lord, as we repent of our sins. Repentance is a, is a grace that we keep, keep using, as it were. We say sorry. We keep on repenting. Because we're not in heaven yet. But we believe to be justified. We owe God a debt. The debt of grace. His free grace. 
mention the loving kindness of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord has bestowed upon us. It's free grace. He's given it to us. Have you embraced it? Do you know it? Do you rejoice because of it? How wonderful it is to have to be saved by grace. You know, when you're born again, you're not a debtor any longer to the divine justice of God. Why is that? Because the price is paid. The price is paid. Jesus paid our debt. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. He's not asking us then to pay anything. He tells us Jesus has paid it all and all to him I owe. Unmerited free grace then, Spurgeon says, becomes ten times more debtors to God than we should ever have been otherwise. It's great to be saved, isn't it? I'm going to say amen. I'm going to say it's great to be saved. But we're not perfect. But it's great to be saved. But we're going to heaven. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life. Amen. Someone writes to me regularly, says, goodness and mercy are like two sheepdogs. Keep us on the straight and narrow. It's quite a nice picture, but, but I like the one I described earlier. It's the presence of God. His rod and his staff. They comfort us. He keeps us away from the rocks. He keeps us out of the potholes. Even when the, the darkness, the darkness of the valley is so so powerful and so gloomy and we don't know where we're going, he, he, he's there and he comforts us and he guides us. Christians then, we must ponder. We must pause. We owe God not justice, but our love, dear friends. We owe him our love. We owe him our praise. Love him, praise him, thank him. The Westminster Confession of Faith, the Presbyterian Catechism says this, What is justification? Justification is the act of God's free grace unto sinners, in which he pardons all their sins and accepts and accounts their person's righteousness in his sight. That's Protestant gospel theology. We're accepted there. We're righteous, not because of us, but because it's imputed, imparted, clothed through faith in Jesus. Hallelujah. My friend, we're saved. We're saved by grace through faith, and it's the gift of God. One man writing on a Christian's adoption, he says, adoption, that is to be brought into God's family after we're born again, is an act of God's free grace whereby we are received into the number and have a right to all the privileges of the sons and daughters of God. Isn't that wonderful? And so by God's grace, we're now called the children of God. And we can pray, Our Father, who art in heaven. And we can cry, Abba, Father, when we long for his embrace. And we can sing, like Philip Doddridge, saved by grace alone. This is all my plea. Jesus died for all mankind, and Jesus died for me. Twas grace that wrote, that wrote my name in life's eternal book. Twas grace that gave me to the Lamb, who all my sorrows took. Yes, we're debtors to his grace. And you've got to repent to get that grace. And you've got to repent to experience that love. And you've got to repent to be blessed by his constant mercy and his promise of eternal life. And so, my friend, let's give him praise. Let's remember, if we're saved, his loving kindness. Let's do the speak according to all the blessings he's bestowed upon us. And let's remember that when Jesus was crucified, he cried out, Into thy hands I commit my spirit. And so let's consider 
how much we owe that love, that forgiving love, that merciful love, that gracious loving kindness. Let us not forget what God has done for us in Christ and his work on the cross. Spurgeon calls it the choice mercies of yesterday. So let us trust the Lord today. Let us trust him tomorrow. Let us say, yeah, I'll trust him till the day breaks and the shadows flee away. I will tell of the Lord's kindness and of the Lord and praises of the Lord according to all that he hath bestowed on us. And as far as I'm concerned, and I hope you agree, this is how we cope when this world is on hold and we await the second coming. We're awaiting the second coming. And the world's on hold for Christ to come back again. And he's going to descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel. And the trump of God will be heard and the dead in Christ will rise first. Hallelujah. Comfort one another with these words, says the scriptures. He's coming again. The world's on hold. It's waiting for Jesus. And what I can see, and I interpret it, you may disagree, that it's going to get worse in the West before it ever gets better. So let's pause and let's ponder for a moment that when Christ cried, it is finished, then there's, we are to live and bathe in that glory and blessing. The price is paid. The work of atonement is complete. The wrath of God is satisfied. The justice of God is fulfilled. The work of Christ Jesus, our Saviour and Mediator, is going on and continues forever. Let's mention the loving kindness. Let's speak about it. Let's tell about it. Let's praise God because of it and for all the blessings. Oh God, our help in ages past. Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, a shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home. I think it's great to be saved. I think the promises are to, believe, to be believed. I think the hope is there and the best is yet to come if we're saved. Amen.